those needs. So, with that all said, let our service of worship begin with the morning prayer. Our opening hymn is Hosanna, Loud Hosanna.
first reading for this morning comes from the epistles from the book of Philippians. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to explain, exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth and under the earth, might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the Father. Go into the village over there, 
As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, the Lord needs it. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet said, Say to daughter Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds in front of him and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this, they asked. The crowds answered, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Tuesdays are very quiet in our church. Rarely do I see anyone or speak to anyone since we've been restricted. Sometimes the solitude is most welcome. Other times in the midst of the quiet, it gets lonely. It's also good for me to find a time to pray. To come into the sanctuary and fall on my knees and ask God for the Spirit's guidance in crafting a sermon, especially so during this pandemic where a mysterious illness and virus threatens all humanity without discrimination. All of us are affected. All of us are at risk. So I know what I want to hear in a sermon on this Sunday. I think we all want to hear words of hope. But hopeful words do not always mean easy words. Sometimes words of hope don't sound very hopeful. We may need to hear words we don't want to hear, like doctors and scientists telling us best case scenario if we all do everything right more than a hundred thousand Americans are going to die because of the coronavirus many are saying we will get through this and we will but at what cost Someone in Louisiana was reported to have said, I just want this to be over so we can have another Mardi Gras. Is there something else to be seen here besides having another party? Is there perhaps a purpose to this pandemic beyond what we are able to see right now Possibly a divine purpose? Author Frank Thomas wrote a book on, on how to preach a dangerous sermon. On how to convey biblical truths that many in the church do not want to hear, but nevertheless need to hear. Either words of scripture they didn't realize were there, or they have chosen to ignore. The author wrote this, Let the Holy Spirit equip you to say what needs to be said in a way in which it can be heard, so that the sermon has a chance to do its work on human hearts without negative consequences. Sounds like a worthy goal. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, 
riding on a donkey on the day we refer to as Palm Sunday, he did so in the midst of a crowd shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, much like the picture that we use for the children's story. He was being proclaimed king. He had come as a prophet from Nazareth to save the people. The whole city was stirred up. Last oppression would end and a new day would be at hand. Indeed, that would prove to be true. But not in the way most had imagined. Because what was about to happen, most people never saw coming. God's divine plan was being carried out in ways that would shake the very core of humanity, ways that still do, even to this day. For more than 40 years, the Journal for Preachers has sought to bring wise and deep resources to preachers who have wanted their sermons to reflect responsible biblical study, theological reflection, and social analysis. Recently, the journal asked these questions. How is the good news of the gospel to be proclaimed as frightened people fill grocery carts to overflowing and we enter into an isolation and a loneliness called social distancing? Or how does the preacher renounce good news to those without a paycheck. So wrote learned biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann. He's a person I mentioned last week, and he shared some insights brought on through many years of studying the Old Testament plagues, and he brought those to the forefront looking at the coronavirus we now face and the questions we now raise. After wading through 12 pages of scholarly exegesis, I felt like I was back in one of the seminary classes in which he raised many valid ideas. For example, he raised the point of biblical covenant with a simple premise that in a tightly ordered world, Obedience is rewarded, disobedience is punished. He quoted the first psalm, The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now the curses that came to the people of Israel were not a natural threat. They simply were a statement of the future that Israel would choose for themselves by the manner in which they ordered their lives. Then there were the prophets of God who preached the message of obedience, blessing, disobedience, and curse. And perhaps his most lucid assistance came from his analysis of the book of Job which is filled and filled with many questions of why, with such limited answers to those questions. After all, who among us knows the mind of God? Where were we at the beginning of creation? Yes, the Bible offers many thoughts and ideas, but not necessarily many answers. So here's what I know. According to John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and the words became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And then if we would turn to the epistles in the first letter to the Colossians, where Paul said, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So it was that the word, Jesus, rode into Jerusalem amidst the cheering crowds when all understanding of God was stood on its collective head by what was about to happen as the week progressed. There would still be Monday, Thursday. There would still be Good Friday. And no one saw the miracle of Easter. I believe I speak correctly for Walter Brueggemann when it comes to the virus. How can we explain the unexplainable? But then how can we explain the resurrection? I want for us to turn to the weakest that is before us with two examples of the unexplainable and how that has shaped our lives. And I offer these examples, stories if you will. They will challenge our thinking about things we know. <coughs> but knowing about something and actually doing something about what we know has consequences to consider. Amy Frickholm is one of the senior editors of the Christian Censor. Kathy and I met Amy eight years ago at St. Olaf College in Minnesota during a week-long conference on worship. Amy and I have kept in contact over the years since we first met her. Her interviews of people of all walks of life are always outstanding, as are the articles that she writes from her heart about her own faith journey. It was in last week's Christian Century she wrote about Monday, Thursday, and the ritual of foot washing. She shared with me her reluctance to write it about it in lieu of the coronavirus epidemic and the plea for social distancing. I understood her dilemma, except that the experience about which she wrote came from a previous Holy Week. After reading her article, I was awestruck by the biblical and theological impact it had on me and in a way that Bright Hope Floral Church has impacted my life more than any other church that I have served. And it's the smallest one in history. Well, I'm going to read her article to you. I, I tried to paraphrase it, and I thought, I will do a disservice if I do that. And so I think the, the article speaks for itself, and it's clear to understand. It begins with the expression on the face of the priest at the Monday Thursday service. She said, I figured foot washing might be his least favorite activity of the church year. His face was wrinkled in what looked like disgust, as if he just realized he actually has to touch some feet. When I approached the altar barefooted, as we had been instructed, he dabbed my feet lightly with a cloth before moving on to the next person in line. I returned to my seat and I was surprised by the depth of my emotion. I felt dismayed, alienated, even distraught. I felt the priest discuss, whether real or imagined. I thought never to return to that church and never to return to that priest. You see, I had been a stranger there and had wandered in on Monday, Thursday to connect with the traditions of Holy Week. Despite the fact that I had spent most of my life in non-liturgical churches, 
the idea of Lent and Holy Week had made an impression on me. That idea of a sacred time was reflected by a slow walk towards Easter. And it settled deep inside of me. I was looking for a church where I could really get my feet washed and I could wash other people's feet. You know, she said almost everyone has feet, yet feet have an uncanny quality about them. And after decades of now being involved in foot washing, I noticed that people frequently all apologize about their feet if they are unwilling to expose them at all, or if they're willing to expose them at all. People tend to find their own feet unsightly. Calluses, bunions, corns, misshapen toes, warts. Most of us keep our feet covered most of the time and have our feet exposed, washed, or even touched by a stranger in the context of church is an act of great vulnerability. Seems like a bad idea to many people. What on earth was Jesus thinking? I can understand why, despite Jesus' admonition in the 13th chapter of John, that his disciples wash one another's feet. Some churches in recent years have substituted hand washing for foot washing. That way is far less vulnerable. And many churches simply gloss over this as though Jesus simply were speaking metaphorically. Whatever our objections to foot washing, Jesus' disciples voiced their own resistance. You will never wash my feet, exclaimed Peter. I've seen dozens of people with the same reaction. And each person's reasoning may be a little different, but the assertion is still the same. Not my feet. And then Jesus comes back with this powerful retort. If I do not wash you, you have no part of me. In a strong words, suggesting that Jesus' command to wash one another's feet ranks pretty high on his list of commands, right up there with love one another. So for us, as much as for Peter, it meant to be about a physical experience that provokes discomfort. She went through a, a series of looking at the history of this, and she said, what I really wanted to know was, how can I join a community to take seriously what the words of Jesus are? I knew it had to be a church with robust practice of foot washing. There could be no dabbing, no disgust, no wishing the practice would go away. I needed a lived theology of foot washing. And that's what I found at St. George Episcopal Church in Leadville, Colorado. On Monday, Thursday, we encouraged people, leave your shoes at the door. We carried big tubs of warm water into the sanctuary. In washing feet, we used homemade soaps. We often apply lotion at the end. To walk an odd line between a ritual foot washing and a pedicure. Foot washing is essential to our theology of hospitality and incarnation. And in a concrete way, that's what we live out in our mission to seek and serve Christ in all persons. Yes, some people refuse to have their feet washed. Some people are just awkward. But sometimes there is a magic that occurs that can only happen through the work of the Holy Spirit. Take the story of Brian. Brian arrived for his first Monday, Thursday service straight from the woods where he had been camping for the better part of the winter. He was hungry and dirty and quite anxious about how his feet and his whole body would be received. 
He apologized as he sat next to me at the meal we had. He ate gratefully. After supper, he said no to the foot washing and sat on the side to watch the proceedings. But then he became intrigued. He cited that foot washing might actually feel pretty good on his tired and aching feet. That day, Brian became a part of our community. He became a regular volunteer at the community meal for church services. He became a person to grab the church laundry and bring it back clean. He made food deliveries. His life began to echo Jesus' words in John 13. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do these things. The knowing began with warm water and a personal risk, and it grew from there. I thanked Amy for giving me a theological insight into God's vulnerability and his desire for us to share such vulnerability with each other. For when we do, as Amy described, we become God's community. I don't like social distancing. I miss you. We are probably going to miss our granddaughter's graduation in Iowa in May. But because we are called to love one another, this is a sacrifice made in love, doing social distancing for the good of all. My other example is also about sacrifice as we move from Monday, Thursday to Good Friday. Many who read the Asheville Citizen Times feel that it is far too liberal, too progressive, for the most part does not reflect conservative values, especially conservative religious values. And one writer in particular receives their disdain. So I'm not quite sure where they might place his March 29th article in the scheme of today's pandemic. He writes to Father Giuseppe Berenandelli, who served a small village not far from Milan. He was 72 years old, died in the hospital of the coronavirus. Father Berenandelli died after he gave away his respirator. The life-saving device had been bought for him by his parish because they loved him so much. But he insisted to go and said to a younger patient who was struggling to breathe, a person the priest did not even know. The article continued, quoting the obvious biblical text, John 15, 13, leaps to our minds. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one another. His death honors the precepts of Jesus. And there's always that little question in the back of our minds, in a moment of crisis, how would you acquit yourself when stuff gets real. Will you do the right thing? Even if it's hard? Even if it demands sacrifice? Are you the soldier who would throw himself on a grenade or someone who rushes to save himself no matter what? Is your response to this crisis we are all facing one of frustration and impatience or one of what can I do to help? We may not
not ever understand this crisis. But we do know this, it's testing us. The question we then must ask, are we answering God's call whether we understand it or not? Are we letting this opportunity just slip by? Or the hope of Easter does tell us that resurrection is real, but it was not expected when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was not expected even at the table meal when Passover was shared. But the turn of events that occurred over the next 24 hours showed the world how far the sacrifice of God was willing to go. And this great vulnerability of God was but a foretaste of what was the meaning behind a triumphal entry. I urge you to read Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Read it with care. Read it prayerfully. And then ask yourself, am I willing to allow myself to be vulnerable? To speak the truth and love? To feed people who are hungry without question? To clothe the naked? To visit the pr prisoner? To welcome the stranger, to wash another's feet, to let my feet be washed. For you see, Jesus is in the middle of all of this. Let us pray. Dear God in heaven, there are so many people in our midst who are making sacrifices. The first responders, those who are at the front lines in hospitals. Just this day we, we received a, a prayer request for the daughter of Sue Miller, Glenda Miller, who was an IR nurse. And perhaps we never considered this before, but as of today, more than 6,000 people have died in America, many of them alone. So we offer to you, God, our prayers for Glenda Miller, for all the, those who are on the front lines and, and are sacrificing their own safety to help others. We pray for Reverend Dot and, and, and Dave Thomas, for Dr. Joseph Newhall, for Kerry Monroe with the loss of his brother, for Anthony Fox as he continues to recover from heart surgery, for H.C. Wyatt. We pray for Amy and Matt and Paul and Kathy. We pray for Lynette Young, for Jane, for Louis Bellum. John Baker, Michael Tipton. Pray for Lucy, for Derek Wilcox, for Betty Hansen, Elizabeth Devereaux, for Jim Brooker, Elsie Young. Pray for Maggie, Angela Fox, Howard and Freedom Mercer, Sabrina English, Jane and Alex Bryant, Karen. Lisa, Harry and Barbara Myers, Brian, Richard Colt, Sherry Lusk, Bill Welsh, Darlene Ogden, Ezra Miller, Howard and Susie Orwell. Pray for Susan Savard, Amanda Angle, John Shelton, Caitlin Payne. Chad and Naomi Thomas.
Thomas and their new daughter, or Naomi's mother, Sandy Howard, Kay and Selma, Marsha Hamilton, Ashley Noriega, Big Kavanaugh, or Bobby Ann Snelson, Don Gahagan, Darlene Probst. Pray for Jerry Spann, or Susan Gray, or Michael, or Carol Wilson, or Nancy Moore, Scott Ashley, Mark, Bruce Fisher, Vicki DePetta, Dixie and Harold Tipton, and pray for Pat, or Tracy Clemens, or Scott Crandall, or Micah, or Danny McIntosh, or Carolee, or the Wolf Creek Academy. And God, we lift you as someone in our silent prayers at this time. do all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, I, I come to a normal time in our service in which we, we talk about the giving of our tithes and our offerings. I simply would ask folks to pass the offering plate as we normally do on a Sunday morning. Yes, we do need to help keep our church afloat, and we are grateful for those who are here doing that, and for those who, who are away, and, and, and we hope will come back, we hope that you can help us keep our heads above water. <coughs> you can always mail your tithe and offering to the church, or you can bring it with you on Friday and or Tuesday. Son 